Spider-Man, the new animated series titled simply Spider-Man on the show itself, is a bit of an anomaly among the franchise's many different television adaptations. This single season show was released in 2003 and animated by Mainframe Entertainment, the studio behind classics such as Reboot, Beast Wars, and Shadow Raiders, produced and often directed by Audu Padden, who had previously worked on Roughneck Starship Troopers, and distributed by MTV, also well known at the time for their own slew of quality cartoons geared towards a more teenage than young adult audience. Mainframe and MTV was a match made in heaven for this type of show. Being distributed by MTV, the show's writers were not hindered by censorship limitations that had previously affected the various Fox Marvel cartoons of the 1990s, including the 1994 Spider-Man animated series which had famously mandated all guns had to fire lasers. This version of Spider-Man is a huge departure tonally from any other well-known adaptation of the source material before it. It has mature themes, frequent depictions of death and sexual content, and even some profanity. Okay, dipstick. Spider-Man the new animated series is also very well written for the most part. The core cast, as well as a wide range of recurring and guest characters, are all well developed and have complex relationships with one another. Sometimes too complex, but we'll get into that. Each episode is a self-contained story featuring one or more memorable guest stars around whom the plot is usually centered. These guest characters are often the highlight of their episodes, though I'm not going to go over them since doing so would necessitate summarizing the events of each episode individually. There's no overarching plot to the series, and only a few episodes even reference events from previous ones, but each story makes sure to develop an emotional narrative in addition to its plot. My favorite Spider-Man stories have always been ones where the main character's two identities are at odds with one another, forcing him to make difficult decisions, and this series delivers a fair few of those. The episode Keeping Secrets is one that particularly stands out in this way. The show also doesn't overly rely on Spider-Man's already impressive rogues gallery, instead frequently putting him up against original foes. There's an episode called Tight Squeeze that's basically Spider-Man meets Die Hard, complete with a Russian Hans Gruber wearing a power suit. I thought I told all of you I want radio silence until further... Be sorry, Hans. I didn't get that message. Alexi, come in, Alexi. Um, uh, Alexi can't come to the phone right now. He's tied up at the moment. There are still some classic villains thrown into the mix, though, most notably Electro. This is easily the most compelling version of Max Dillon I've ever seen. Max? What's happened to- They don't know! They don't understand! His story is similar here to what it was in The Amazing Spider-Man 2, though this version of the character completely puts that other one to shame. Come to think of it, this show's version of The Lizard also puts The Amazing Spider-Man version to shame. Not that that's hard or anything, I just thought I'd point it out. The show was originally set to adapt the Ultimate Spider-Man comic series, a then fairly recent reboot of the original comic attempting to reach new demographics. Plans changed, however, for Spider-Man the new animated series after the massive success of the 2002 Hollywood Spider-Man film directed by Sam Raimi. The show's focus shifted to reflect the new film's continuity, despite Ultimate Spider-Man's creator, Brian Michael Bendis, having already been brought on to write and produce. To this end, many elements from the movie's story have been incorporated into the show, such as Mary Jane Watson and Harry Osborn being positioned alongside Peter Parker as a trio of main characters. The story picks up about a year after the end of the first Spider-Man film. Peter, Harry, and MJ are college students and best friends, with Harry and Peter rooming together in a ridiculously expensive-looking Manhattan apartment. Harry also mourns his father's death, which he blames on Spider-Man, while Peter and MJ are stuck in a will-they-won't-they -they sort of relationship. They've even got Keith Carradine doing a J.K. Simmons impression as J. Jonah Jameson. It's 25 bucks each. Make it 125 even. But whatever it is, save it. You're wasting time. Go snap some shots. Just remember, this is a high-class newspaper, not Animal Planet. While a lot of these plot and character elements carry over from the Raimi film, little else does. None of the returning characters besides Besides Jameson, who isn't much more than a cameo, bear any resemblance to their big screen counterparts either in looks or personality. It also feels nothing like the campy, somewhat anachronistic world of the Raimi film. Instead, Spider-Man the new animated series is attempting to be as modern as possible in style with a hip, sleek, early 2000s youth culture affectation – this is MTV we're talking about – including a number of contemporary pop culture references – I bet the X-Men get to go to parties – coupled with a fully electronic soundtrack eschewing Danny Elfman's orchestral film score. Aunt May is also absent from the series entirely since MTV thought that the presence of an elderly character would be off-putting to their teenage audience. No, I'm not joking. Sony had a distinct visual style in mind for this series. They wanted it to resemble comic book art, with bright colors and an outer line enclosing the visible edge of all objects as if they were two-dimensional drawings. To accommodate these requests, Mainframe Entertainment had to rework several conventions of the animation style from their previous projects. As trailblazers in the 
field of CGI animation, they'd always done their best to emphasize the 3D elements in their work, while now they found themselves tasked with making objects appear more two-dimensional, like traditional cell animation. They'd done something similar once before in an episode of Reboot's fourth season, attempting to emulate an anime aesthetic, though the technique is far more refined here. To look like an illustration. That may sound easy, but it was actually a very difficult technological achievement to pull that off. The final product uses two-tone shading, meaning each surface is made up of only two color tones representing either lit or shadowed, with no gradation between the two. This coupled with fewer light sources than usual made for a striking, dynamic visual style that would actually catch on and become fairly popular just a few years down the line. The show's character models look great, and they have a wide range of expressions. There are some strange-looking necks on occasion, but I'd say that over Overall, the show's animation has aged incredibly well considering it's over 15 years old at this point. There are one or two unintentionally hilarious animation moments, though. <laughs> A combination of motion capture and keyframe animation was used in order to easily lend the characters natural-looking body movements through motion capture while still being able to animate superhuman or highly acrobatic feats through keyframing, as had been done on Mainframe's earlier projects. Spider-Man's uh, kind of a dream for an animator, an action animator to work on because he goes to extremes. And the fact that uh, he's not expected to be human, he's expected to be superhuman gives these guys license to really push things. And it is a cartoon, so you get away with things. I mean, you push them, you snap them, you you stretch them to the extreme. This series honestly has some of my favorite Spidey movement in the entire franchise. Action sequences look great and have a fantastic flow to them. They blow the Raimi movie's action out of the water. And it's CGI for that matter. The cast of Spider-Man the New Animated Series is riddled with celebrity cameos and guest roles, including, but not limited to, Stan Lee, of course, Keith David, Tara Strong, Kathy Griffin, Jeremy Piven, Michael Dorn, Jeffrey Combs playing a mad scientist, which is awesome, Michael Clark Duncan reprising his role as Kingpin from the Ben Affleck Daredevil film that came out earlier that year, and Rob freaking Zombie as Dr. Kurt Connors. Court throughout my case. Someone pulled strings. God, if I'd been like two or three years closer to my edgy teenage years when this show came out, that would have absolutely blown my mind. Go home, Parker. Finally, the titular role of Spider-Man and Peter Parker is played in this series by none other than Neil Patrick Harris, several years before his career renaissance was sparked by projects like How I Met Your Mother, Dr. Horrible's sing-along blog, and the Harold and Kumar films. NPH does a great job in the role, perfectly capturing both the cautious unassuredness of Peter Parker Deep down inside me, I'm afraid there's a big, boring nothing. As well as Spider-Man's glib banter. Take a swipe at Spidey Days ended last month. It was just a short promotional offer. He even went on to reprise the role in 2010 for the video game Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions. Whoa, whoa, slow down. Other realities? Other me's? Peter is more mature in this series than he's usually portrayed, owing again to the fact that this version of the character is a little bit older than most. He also seems to be a bit more adept than usual at balancing his Spider-Man life with his social life as well as his studies and part-time jobs. At the end of the day, that isn't saying much, his double life still becomes a sticking point on multiple occasions throughout the show. Every time anyone anywhere asks you to do anything, you're like, unavailable. Though it's never as big of an issue here as it would be later on, in Spider-Man 2. Harry Osborn is portrayed as a typical sort of carefree slacker. Despite attending school, he doesn't devote any time whatsoever to his studies, knowing that his vast inheritance will probably carry him. Witness the power of Osborn. Instead, Harry spends most of his time chasing after the ladies, though he is forced at times to confront the legacy of his father and his hatred of Spider-Man. I actually think this inner conflict of Harry's is handled much better in this TV series than in any of the Raimi films, where his demeanor oddly seems a lot more cartoonish cartoonish than here on the actual cartoon. Mary Jane, on the other hand, doesn't fare as favorably as Harry. Most of her character revolves around her complicated relationship with Peter, which is extremely scattered and ill-defined. Do I have some kind of weird pheromone that shouts out to Peter Parker? Run away! Run away! MJ. Look, I don't know anything about pheromones, but this is probably not helping your case. Actually, if there is one aspect of the show that I don't really care for, it's the romance. Chiefly because the writers can't seem to get anything about it straight. While the events of each episode concerning Peter's love life make sense in a vacuum, when you watch them all in a row, none of it lines up at all, appearing to swing wildly from episode to episode. The word I'm looking for is consistency. Okay, so the film takes place right after the first Raimi film, right? Which concluded with MJ confessing
confessing her love to Peter and Peter rejecting her. It's been a while though, things can change. The first episode of the series shows the two of them kiss like it's no big deal while they're just hanging out on the couch with Harry, but then in the second episode, Peter's suddenly all, Aw, oh, gee, th there's no way a girl like her would be interested in a guy like me. I'll tell you. For a smart dude, you can be pretty clueless sometimes. But then in episode 3, they're back to kissing once again, and at this point, both characters are interested in pursuing a relationship with one another. Thanks for letting me do that. Not a problem. Except later on, in the sixth episode, he meets a new girl, an original character created specifically for the show named Indy, who Peter has much more in common with than he does MJ. Indy has dreams of being a news reporter, which fit perfectly in line with Peter's dream of journalistic photography. Work with me and we'll both go to the top. Were you about to ask me out? I'm pretty sure that's where I was headed. And the answer is yes. This kicks off a confusing and inconsistent Betty and Veronica style love triangle subplot that lasts the remainder of the series and never gets any kind of payoff. Two women, both into Peter. If he plays his cards right, nah. Ultimately though, as big of a fuss as I seem to be making out of this, it really is a pretty minor complaint in the grand scheme of things. It kind of feels to me like maybe the show's individual script writers just weren't coordinating well enough between one another what the status quo of the romance subplot was going to be from episode to episode. There's no two-for-one special, Petey. There isn't? No! So, how does the one and only season of Spider-Man the New Animated Series end? Is it another cliffhanger? Yes it is! That's no surprise though, this series is brought to us by MTV and animated by Mainframe Entertainment, the two kings of prematurely cancelled cartoons from this era. As you'd expect, these two dastardly forces managed to create one of the most crushingly depressing, most cliffhangiest cliffhanger endings ever conceived by mortal minds, rivaling even the hunt from Reboot. What an appropriate end to what I would consider the final great television show from this legendary animation studio. If this show was so great though, how come it wasn't renewed for a continuation? Well, Wikipedia cites a lack of ratings, which could certainly be a factor, but I'm also guessing the series probably ran somewhat over budget. The same article mentions that several episodes were held up due to production delays, and in these bonus features on the DVD, many different people working on the show emphasize how much more difficult it is to produce than most other projects. Vast sums of other people's money are involved, and you've got to get it right. Um, if you do it right, they let you do it again. Overall, I would definitely recommend Spider-Man the New Animated Series. While the Raimi-centric status quo of the series plot could have been seen as lazy at the time, the connection is purely superficial. This series is refreshing to look back on nowadays, with so many subsequent iterations of Spider-Man set in high school, and it's nice to see a Peter Parker who feels at least a little bit more experienced and world-weary than the character is usually portrayed. I like that this series isn't afraid to take big chances with its storytelling, and I love that it doesn't feel the need to tread over the same old ground, or sides of buildings, that so many other Spider-Men do, giving the viewer a different type of story than what you're used to with the property. It's partly for this same reason that I can't wait to check out the latest entry in the franchise, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, which marks the big screen debut of Miles Morales, a character who made his original comic debut in Ultimate Spider-Man, the same comic that this show started off adapting. Funny how that works out. Despite being somewhat old and obscure, Spider-Man the New Animated Series is also super easy to get a hold of. I picked up the complete series on DVD for just 5 bucks Canadian back in July, though it is a bit more now. I've tried my best to avoid any plot details in this video because I'd highly encourage you to seek out the series for yourself. This is better than I expected. If you're a big Spider-Man fan and you haven't seen this version, I'd say you owe it to yourself to check it out. It's just, to me, everything that an adventure animated series should be. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you could help me out a lot if you'd hit the like button, subscribe for more like this in the future, and ring the bell to make sure you catch the latest videos, like these videos up on the screen. Drop a comment down below with your thoughts on Spider-Man the new animated series, and also let me know what's your favorite version of Spider-Man and why. Thanks very much once again to all of you for watching, and take care.